I gotta tell you. Is it Jessica? I don't mean to sound like a pervert or anything, but I just sat here trying to figure out what your bat mitzvah was like. <laughs> because something very important has happened for me in this last year. And uh, this was a chance to really process this information and tell you a story. And it's really, I'm, I tell stories best when I write. I, 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 so I've, I've started writing songs and I really enjoy doing that a lot. And I really enjoy performing them. But I had to coalesce this story into seven minutes so I could also sing you a song that goes with the story. So I feel like Houdini. I feel like I, I, I'm submerging down and I have one breath to break these chains and cut loose some story, you know, and free it into your minds in one breath. So here goes. I was in a movie. I was cast in a movie a year ago. And I want to tell you a little something about this movie. This movie was called The Cherokee Word for Water. The Cherokee Word for Water was filmed in, the Tele in Tahlequah, Oklahoma. This is the capital of the Cherokee Nation. And this movie is about, it's a story, it's based on a, very, a true story of the Bell community in eastern Oklahoma, not far from Tahlequah, in the foothills of the, I guess the Ozarks, it's really beautiful, the Illinois River runs through, it's very wooded, it's hilly, it's magnificent, and this is what I guess you could call a reservation, but I didn't really understand the difference between a nation and a reservation. It was like a town. It had a, a college. It was a, it's a beautiful place. In fact, I called Patty. I go, God, you know, I've always wanted to go back to a small town. I'm from Victoria. But I'm always just, it's like, it's never going to work out because I'm not like a redneck anymore. <laughs> but I said, you know, Tahlequah is this amazing place because it's a small town. Everybody's so friendly. And it's because they have like this 5,000 year old hippie culture. They're like the original hippies. It's like, Patty, can we hug you? Know. <laughs> so, this movie about the Bell community, it's about the Bell community water line that was dug in this little community that was so, so indigent that it didn't even have running water. And this community was broken. This community is back, well, the transition that this movie is about, this film is about, happens in the 1980s, early 80s. Wilma Mankiller, who eventually became the chief of the Cherokee tribe, the principal chief, she had just moved with her daughters from San Francisco. Her father had signed some treaty that said that they had to leave Oklahoma back in the 50s, and she had returned home to be with her people. She was looking for work, and she went to see uh, principal chief Ross Swimmer. She asked him for work, and he said, well, we don't really have any. This was at the Cherokee National Headquarters. He said, we don't really have any work, but there's this community about 40 miles from here, and it's really in trouble. They don't even have running water. Maybe you can go out there, and you can figure out a way to sort of help them. Charlie Soap, a, a fine gentleman, worked in the office there, and he went to sort of escort her out there because she didn't know where it was. And Charlie Soap's a good man. He was in construction. He worked in the office there. And when they got out to Bell Community, there was a community center, and they held a meeting. Wilma's very bright. She's not with us anymore as of about two years ago. But she was very bright, and she was young, and she was strong, and she had a lot of energy, and she had a lot of compassion and empathy for her people and everyone. And she sort of assessed this situation. And somehow, she and Charlie figured out how to get this community to become so bitter because they had expected handouts from the federal government and from the Cherokee Nation, and they were always disappointed because nothing ever came in. But Charlie and Wilma figured out a way to reintroduce Cherokee native tradition and that comes with a word called Gadugi. I learned this word. It's a great word, and it means a community that all comes together and it's the spirit of this community that can all come together for a higher good of everyone. So if your barn burns down, we all get together and we're going to build you a new barn. All of us. 
And somehow, together, she broke that bitter spirit, and they dug a pipeline. She asked if everyone would just dig a, a, a trench from one side of their property to the other. And somehow, we will connect all of those trenches, and we'll have a water line. Now, mind you, this trench was this deep. It was this deep. It was a foot and a half wide. And when they finished, this trench and this pipeline connected to Stillwell, Oklahoma, 16 miles away. Now imagine, when's the last time you like dug a hole for a tree or whatever? <laughs> imagine doing that with five of your friends, day in and day out, against all odds, against all shitty weather, hot, cold, frozen. Start at the Mopac Bridge and start with a pick and shovel and go all the way to Longhorn Dam, cross it, come all the way back, to the Mopac Bridge, and then go all the way back to the Longhorn Dam again with a pick and a shovel. They did it. And this was so empowering to this community that they thought, why don't we build a school? We could build a school. If we do this, we could build a school. And, if, and the kids, you know, we'll keep them healthy. We'll build them a basketball court out back. And I, you know, how about a library? And in this town hall, they managed to do this. And it, it garnered national attention when Dan Rather came down and covered the story in 1981. It was a big deal. And it was a huge deal for the, for the nations, the, for our indigenous nations. It was like, you can dig yourself out of this crap that you, we've all gotten into. So, I was the only white person cast in this movie. And I was cast, personally, by Charlie Soap. Wilma and Charlie and I were friends through a neighborhood friend here, Jim Brand, who was like a big brother to me. And we all became very fast friends. And after years and years, I heard that they had been working on this movie for about 20 years. And I said to them, I said, if there's any way I can contribute in any way to this story about contemporary, you know, Indian culture, it's like I'll, I'll peel out and I'll take out or whatever it takes. I just want to. Well, Charlie cast me as this fellow named Curly McQuista. And I want to tell you about Curly, because I learned the first day on the set about Curly, who I really didn't understand. The Cherokee Nation was willing to subsidize all the Cherokee people in this final hookup of this water line, which was quite expensive. Curly McQuista was a, I said, Charlie, who was this person? And I asked Charlie at the first day, and it was in a cafeteria, and Charlie's this beautiful, tall man. He looks like the guy on the Big Chief Cabinet. He really does. He has this beautiful, long, gray, flowing hair. And he's tall, and he's very proud. And he has like this incredible turquoise and silver jewelry and rings. And he wears one of these like amazing, they're like bones, and it's like a throat plate, you know, that Indian warriors wear. And he's so majestic. And I, and I sat down and I said, Charlie, tell me about Charlie, uh, Curly. He said, well, I'll tell you what. Curly was a great guy. He was the only white guy in the community. He was an incredible, like, shade tree mechanic. He could fix anything. He was so poor. He wore the same clothes pretty much day in and day out. He was filthy from all the stuff he worked on. Now, Curly, you know, they made fun of him in the town, the Cherokee, because they overlooked his good heart. And he had a wife, and she was Cherokee. And she was blind. And together they had five daughters who he adored. And he lived to take care of them. But in that, he was always willing to help whoever came along and needed any kind of help. He said that Curly, on this project for Bell Waterline, he, his services weren't asked for because he wasn't going to get anything out of it. But he was the first one there every day always willing to fix anything that needed to be fixed, always there to drive a backhoe, which I had to learn how to drive, it was really fun. And he, when the project was over, Charlie told me, he said, you know, I sat down next to Curly and I said, Curly, I bet you're glad this is over. We did it, we did it. And he said, Curly, well done. And he said, you know, Charlie, I'm really sorry this is over. All these people, together doing this project. This is true. God do gee. I know what this is now. And Charlie said this was an, a wonderful thing. Now, there was a guy named Moses Bringsplay who was cast as Charlie, also by Charlie. And Moses and I became friends. He's a great guy. He's a Lakota 
Uh, he's their spiritual leader of the Lakota people. Great guy. Really funny, really silly on one hand, and so just rock hard, laser beam serious about his tradition on the other. Amazing. When he holds a sweat, it's as though God is in that tent with you. It's incredible. Moses said, you know, I love this movie because we're not a bunch of like, you know, redskins running around half naked on a horse with a bunch of frickin' war paint running around like some kind of, you know, period warriors. This is a contemporary piece, and it's about, it's about contemporary Indian Native pro problems. And what I like about your part, then, as Curtin, is for once, the white man is the minority, and he's the underdog, and only by his goodness and virtuous acts of helping do we use our tradition of Gadugi and reciprocity to embrace him as one of our own? And I have to finish this story by telling you how life really became artwork for me. There was a final scene, or a scene in the movie, where the community, Bell community, came together for Curly and his family because he didn't have money to hook up to the pipeline, but he had been there every single day helping and running the backhoe, making friends with everybody, and they had this bake sale. And in this bake sale, there were kachina dolls, and there were baked you know, the cookies and cakes, and, and, and all kind of great things to eat that they were selling, and there was pottery, and they were for Curly's family. They were to raise money. Well, what Moses liked about this is this and he came to me and he said, this is a big deal, Ben. This is very important. This is a pivotal scene where despite the fact that your people have fucked us over for so many centuries, that we, as this people and our beliefs, that the, underneath all of this, we are all human beings. We embrace you as just another human being together in this effort as our family. And I kind of, you know, it's like, I don't come from this. It, it, it came slow to me. I, I, I walked around and I was like, how do I internalize this? It's like, I kind of don't get it. And on the surface, it's like, yeah, oh, that's cool. And the director came to me and he said, who's this like a fledgling director? And he crouches down next to me and he says, you know, look at that Kachina doll and just imagine, man, that's going to sell for $200 just for me. And I just like, I was trying to internalize this and I said, Tim, please. Just please just go away and leave me alone. I'm trying to understand this on a real level. When the scene started rolling, my, my entrance was to come in and to sort of notice all this and just go, oh my God, I can't believe this is all for me and my family. And I walked into the scene and, and I looked around and I saw all of this, these things. And I imagine these are traditional pieces of artwork that have, and, and food that they would sell to help themselves. But today, they're doing this for me. They're doing this for my family because we're now family. And the scene was rolling and I forgot and I, I forgot my lines and I just, it, I was so emotionally uh, just moved that I broke down and I started just welling up and I just sort of was paralyzed and I was in front of three women who were principal actresses in this thing and I, I said, I don't know what to say. And I was so just captivated by this moment of, of, of humanness that I, um, I just wept. And I remember in that moment that Teresa Leach, who was one of these women, she broke her character and her lines, and she just reached out, and she gave me this great big hug, and, and I just, like, kind of sat there sort of in her arms, and I just, like, was just absorbing and soaking in and feeling, like, the gravity and the levity of this word. God do give this community. We're all one in this world. And so that, for me, was the moment that I understood that life does imitate art. Because at that moment, Curly and Ben were one thing, and I was so connected to all of this. And it was a beautiful moment. And so I wrote this song for my friends 
my new family. And I was hoping that this song would somehow, somehow communicate to them that even if I didn't get it, I tried to. <laughs> and so this song is called How To Be. They raise their bows towards the smoking mirrors. The shadows they saw were their own. They set their sights on the great beyond. Their trophy was neither flesh or bone. Yadugi. Do you remember a time so dark? I can't forget when our mouths were dry. But when you're all alone in the middle of the desert, it's hard to remember any reasons why. But it's a long, hard road travel, and it's a long time before the sun goes down. Walk alone and we'll come unravel, but together we'll find our way home. God, Sixteen miles is a long way to walk when you're buried alive in thick quicksand. Now try digging that far with a pick and shovel. Now try digging that far with your two bare hands. Brothers and sisters, God do be. Mrs. and Mrs. God do be. With every rising sun. Long after the job is done, God Well, it's about as many ways to the spirit as there are folks who want to find it. Yeah, it just depends on if you want to hear it. If you want to live this life, you can't hide behind it, God do Find our own way home, God Now this is the part that I've hoped that we can all get together as our own community, right here in Austin, together. And we're going to borrow this word from the Cherokee. And we're going to sing together, I hope. 